All right, so, so much. Thanks for joining. Um, so much. We went to business school, obviously, together, and you've been in the venture capital world for a very long time. Um, would you mind just maybe for the benefit of the listeners, just telling us, you know, your background and in particular, IVP's background? Sure, I'm happy to do that, Brandon. First of all, thanks for having me. I hope your family is safe and all your colleagues at Fifth Wall are safe in this uh, really difficult time. I hope everybody listening also is in a safe and healthy place. Um, it's not normal circumstances uh, in which we're doing this, and my heart goes out to everybody affected by the pandemic. Um, as Brendan said, you know, I've been at IVP. I'm coming up on the 15-year anniversary since I started. Um, my quick background, uh, I'm the son of Indian immigrants. I uh, grew up in the Bay Area, kind of hit the genetic lottery in that my parents both worked in the technology industry in the 80s and 90s. So I was surrounded by innovation and entrepreneurship um, and just amazing builders. Um, went to UC Berkeley, uh, always had a fascination in both science and um, liberal arts. I studied biology as well as business administration. Uh, and interestingly, Brendan, one of my research topics my junior year was around um, global health crises. And so a uh, little relevant to what's going on today. Um, and then my first job was at a company called Sybase, uh, which is a database company that had lost the word Oracle in the 90s. Fell in love with just um, the technology industry and software. Learned an important lesson, which is my personality is best suited for innovation and growth, not for turnaround. Sybase was a turnaround at the time. Um, and then worked at a couple startups. Um, ended up at IVP um, probably most directly because I worked for an investment bank, kind of like you did originally, called Credit Suisse First Boston, in the tech banking group. And it was a run by um, an individual named Frank Quattrone, who went on to start Catalyst and is a well-known um, tech advisor, I would say, and financier. Um, I got to see there, um, it was a time not too dissimilar from now. I joined there in 2003. And at the time, the headlines were, um, startups are done. Uh, American innovation, especially in digital, is over. China is going to essentially have all the growth. This is 2003, mind you. Um, the only thing that's going to work is Salesforce, because they had just gone public. Uh, Yahoo is going to dominate the internet um, and eBay. Uh, Amazon is a short. So this was sort of the consensus thinking. And in the midst of that, we had a chance to work on the IPO of Google. And I got to see um, up close, just you know, be, behind closed doors, what the foundation of that company was and what they were building. And they completely redefined how you think about search, as you know, in the advertising markets. And um, when that IPO went out, um, to me, it was a sign that like the contrarian point of view was actually Silicon Valley and, and um, digital innovation are going to continue. The U.S. is still a great place to um, invest capital. And then through that process, I got to meet IVP because they were early investors in Netflix. Concur, just to be clear so much, that was, that was a contrarian view at the time. That was a very contrarian view. The consensus view was it's over. The yeah. dot-com bust is here to last. Um, you know, I remember living in South of Market, you know, not far from where you lived once upon a time. And there was just commercial uh, real estate vacancy signs, residential real estate was went through a tough time. And um, as we know, the last 10 years were quite good uh, for South of Market in San Francisco. Um, but the key thing, my key insight from that period was, um, you can't time cycles, you can't time markets. Uh, innovation will always go through these ebbs and flows. And uh, what I really liked about IVP was, they had been in business through you know, an early 80s recession, the 87 stock market crash, the late 90s recession, um, the pre the mid 90s recession, and then of course 2002, which was pretty pretty bleak in the tech market. And um, they viewed it as much as the, you know, you got to do your core and keep your portfolio companies um, up and running, but also it's a great time to be an investor because valuations come down. And so um, among our two best funds in the last 40 years were the 2000. Vintage Fund, which invested in the dot-com bus crisis. And then actually the, our 12th fund, IDP 12, $600 million fund invested from 2007 to 2010. Brendan, and th that fund um, has returned a 3.5x cash on cash return to our limited partners because of the fact that we continued investing through the crisis. We had a few LPs who actually uh, didn't come into that fund because they were worried about valuations coming down. They saw the headlines. And uh, many of them actually ended up coming into the next few funds because they realized that it's just, um, you can't time these things and you need to always be in market. You can control allocations. You can think about how much you want to invest, but to completely be out of a fund 
just because of headline risk is usually the wrong decision in hindsight. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is for a firm like Fifth Wall, obviously a lot of our LPs are, are strategic LPs, and right. Fifth Wall represents um, really their first, or in many cases, their only venture capital investment. Um, and we've obviously built our firm in, in quote good times, right? In right. when valuations are just increasing at a, at a sector level. Um, what would you say if, if you were kind of a first time LP in a fund, how would you yeah. think about timing? Is, is timing really like that beta element? Is timing really like a accentuator of alpha? Like how would you think about that? I think it's a key variable uh, because I actually think so. One of the most important things we learned in the last crisis is um, venture the, capital. This, this is the OA crisis. OA crisis. The venture capital is an asset class. There's an interesting hodgepodge of personalities that work in it. Um, many of the people in venture capital have actually never been institutional investors in both the bull market and bear market. I think one thing that is interesting about Fifth Wall to me is that you worked at Blackstone. You have team members that worked in the last crisis. You know. You were part of an institutional investing platform. And just the, the frameworks and learnings you have when you're managing someone else's money in a downturn are really important. And I actually think like, especially you know, given the DNA of your firm, a lot of that went into the way you thought about the firm, which is how do you think about initial capital outlays? How do you think about value add? How do you think about reserve analysis? How do you think about liquidity, right? And I think the fact that you have a fund ready to go uh, that's raised and ready to invest in this market is a really powerful asset. A lot, what we typically see is um, a fight or flight mentality. Those, there's going to be a lot of, not right now, because remember, we're only in, Brendan, week five after an 11 year bull market run. We're in week five. And people are already saying, well, Q3 is going to be amazing and we're going to rebound. And I hope they're right, but history would serve as a great primer that it's likely that this is going to be a long recovery. This is not going to happen in one quarter. This will take four or five, six quarters. And um, we have a lot of good things to look forward to at the end of the tunnel, but that's the beauty of a 10-year fund. That's the beauty of the corporates you work with is they have a long-term outlook. You know, if you're a, you know, hedge fund trading in and out, it'd be much tougher, I think, to invest in this sort of an environment. Um, I think for you guys, the thing that I really uh, would say for, you know, your LP base looking at, at your asset class is I just think, the way you write memos, the way you, you know, I've obviously got a chance to see you guys in action. The way you think about um, a thesis, that's why um, I think you guys are well served because it's one thing to pay up for a company. It's another thing to be direct with your investors about why you paid up or why you didn't pay up in, in a follow on round. Because then you have at least a framework by which to debate um, the correct decision and then you have learning. And so I think you guys have learned a lot in the last couple of years of what to do and a lot of things probably what not to do. And I think that actually will serve as a great example. We, we found with our, our firm, we do a lot of documentation around what went right, what went wrong, lessons learned. And I think in just what we're doing right now, and actually we, we kicked it off last week is this series called a VTI virtual teaching. Cause we have a lot of young people who've never been through a crisis or weren't an IVP in 2008, 2009. And you know, it's something you guys may think about it's actually literally a Zoom call we do once a week where we take a different part of um, our firm and say, hey, how do you interact with CEOs in a crisis? Like, what are the right ways to push on them? What are the right ways to support them? How do you think about public investing? We do some um, public investing as well. How do you think about building a public thesis and communicating that to LPs that's different from private companies? How do you think about liquidity? How do you think about reserves? So I actually think like we're, the venture business has always been an apprenticeship business. And you guys structured Fifth Wall to be the same. So in a way, the blessing of this is we all have more availability to do Zoom calls and you can on a spot get everyone together at the firm. And I think people are really listening to each other in a way that it's just harder to do in the height of a bull market where people are running amok. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, one of the things you and I have talked a lot about like over the last couple of years is, you know, there was, it feels like a long time ago there was this plenty in late stage markets around the super fast growth um, oftentimes kind of like that had already started to inflect at the end of last year. Do you think that this 
is really a kind of like double underscore of many of those same conclusions from 2019. Like this just yeah. accelerates and accentuates why you really need to have a fundamental approach, which I know IDP has around yeah. evaluating these obviously hyper growth, but fundamentally strong businesses and how they are distinct from the, the WeWorks of the world. I think that's right. I mean, you and I talked a lot about it, but fundamentally the, the key thing a lot of investors miss is they get data can be a great asset and a great liability. If you just focus on growth and the second derivative of growth, as we call it, you miss the fact that markets are dynamic. And so one of the things you guys do a lot of is you dig in with your corporate partners around why is a market changing or tipping? Why is an incumbent either um, vulnerable in a way that a startup can take that share? Why is that share shifting quickly? What's the market size and growth? I think those are like a lot of people pay lip service, but don't really spend time on it. They just look at a company and go, oh, it's growing fast, must be a big market. So I, I actually think you guys are well served in some sense because you focus on fundamentals, you focus on markets. I think for a lot of these companies, the reality is um, they, some of them have the DNA where they understand that you have to grow slow to grow fast. Um, and pause me if you can't hear me, by the way. I got you. Okay. Um, I think others are just only designed to basically be spending money um, with zero regard for what the end business is. I mean, here's a great thing that you, I'm sure you understand from your Blackstone training. All right, so much. I, I think I, uh, I have you back. Um, so where did we lose you? I think we, you, were, you were talking about how a lot of the trends that we saw in 2019 were underscored um, or really have been accelerated by virtue of what we're going through now. One yeah. of the things we've talked a lot about is, you know, the, the kind of decline of the, the tourist venture capital firms, right? Yeah. Uh, a lot of the upstart firms and, and frankly, a lot of the corporate venture funds. I think corporate yeah. venture has always been the space that has been incredibly challenged. There's kind of a stigma associated with it with firms like yourself. Um, right. And I think there's also just an element of their scene is really episodic. It's always challenging to bring in the right talent. And I think the most important right now is around the long-term versus short-term mindset. Um, and I'm curious, you've been through other cycles. What have you seen happen with corporate venture funds in prior cycles? Yeah, it's a good question, Brendan. I think um, what's interesting about corporate venture funds is I think a lot of them didn't end up hitting their own internal goals more because of um, kind of an implosion versus an explosion. The incentive structures were sometimes not set up in the right way, as you know, from running a fund, you have to, number one, attract the best and brightest who um, are rewarded when they do well with an investment and also um, not rewarded when they don't. And I think um, a good example uh, is, another thing about venture firms that's important to remember is that moving fast is super important. Like companies are moving at breakneck speed. The definition of hyper growth means someone's running really hard and running fast. And you're not... Um, looked upon as an attractive source of capital if you have a long internal bureaucratic process. And so what we saw in the last time was, uh, I'll kind of give you a tale of two firms. One was um, Intel Capital, which I think is an amazing um, institution, one of the first corporate VCs. They um, became almost too big and too unwieldy where they had over a thousand people as part of Intel Capital in the last cycle um, across the world distributed but we worked with them and you know, in many ways they're very helpful, but within Intel, they couldn't even get you sometimes to the key line of business that you needed to understand if this was strategic or not because the relationships weren't there and they were just so um, encumbered by a large bureaucratic infrastructure that they didn't end up um, capitalizing on their early lead as a corporate VC. The other side of it is Sapphire Ventures, which you know well, you know them. Um, they came out of SAP, which, you know, at first blush, you think about it and say, okay, SAP, German company, older company, um, they're probably slow moving. But what's interesting is they, they kept the team very lean, very small, and they didn't just make it around something that sells only um, enterprise application software uh, that could be a part of one of their three or four key product areas. They had a broader lens. And because of that, they hired some of the best and brightest that kept the team small. And now Sapphire Ventures is one of the leading firms SAP continues to be one of their largest LPs, but they brought in some outside capital too. And it's a nice hybrid model. Um, that's kind of a, a tale of two firms. I think the main thing that corporates need to realize is, so I think the last decade was a boom of sort of startups eating 
uh, the lunch of technology companies. So if you think about a lot of the growth in startups and consumer and enterprise, it was taking share from the Googles and the Facebooks and the Ebays and Amazons. Um, and an enterprise. Zero, zero sum. With yes, it. exactly. I think the next decade is going to, and we're seeing it already in the beginning of this, this next decade, is going to be taking share from other verticals, other industries. So a good example of this is healthcare. I mean, I think we can all agree that healthcare is going to be completely transformed after this pandemic. And if you look at the way, we're probably not going to have a world in which our kids go back to CVS and Walgreens and stand in line with a bunch of sick people to get their prescription meds. So companies like GoodRx, NimbleRx are all going to, we're not investors in either of these, but are, I think, you know, here to stay. Um, ed tech is transforming the way our kids learn and the way secondary, like today, if you go to Princeton or Stanford, it's going to be a very different experience than um, what it was when we graduated, which a lot of the curriculum and collaborations online. And I even think you think about traditional industries like ag tech, construction, industrials, pharmaceuticals, many of them are going to be transformed by startups. Startups are going to go after those big market opportunities. So I actually think in some ways you guys um, are at the cusp of watching a transition in the real estate world from analog to digital, but then from digital to data also. I think it's not just about putting something online. It's about being able to capture a lot of resident data, be able to analyze it with proprietary software, and then to be able to make it actionable and act on it. And I think a lot of startups are going to come that take the share of that. We were early investors in LoopNet, which, as you know, got bought by CoStar and was part of the commercial real estate marketplace. And one of the things we're seeing is new entrepreneurs approaching us saying, you know, those marketplace models were built 20 years ago. And LoopNet and CoStar were two amazing companies in that space. But there's a way to do that without the physical infrastructure of a marketplace. There's a way to actually do it completely digital where using things like sensors and IoT, you can actually pick up and capture data at the site itself and be able to create almost inside up a new loop that marketplace for commercial real estate or new co-star marketplace. <laughs> so I just think in, in some ways, this will ha uh, accelerate the transition that was inevitable. We thought these transitions would take five to 10 years. I think with COVID-19, <laughs> we're gonna see some of these industries transform in 18 to 24 months. Yeah, it's interesting that the real estate industry has been this, industry that's been so slow moving. I mean, the, the real estate industry basically sat out like two, three yeah. decades worth of innovation and something happened around 2016 where real estate owners recognized they needed to have a point of view on new technologies, both offensively to save money, to uh, capture more revenue, to kind of get into adjacent business models, but then also defensively to kind of right. avoid this kind of imminent disruption, this losing market share to emerging new tech companies. Um, and what still has characterized the real estate industry, even in the last three years, is that consumer preferences change slowly, right? Yeah. So the idea that, you know, today there's so much talk about e-commerce and how much market share e-commerce has. And <clears throat> candidly, it's actually very small. It's, it's about small. 10 to 15% of total U.S. retail. However, and I don't think this stat has been calculated today, I mean, U.S. retail has dropped to about 20% of the volume it was or it had achieved about 60 days ago. And yet I would imagine e-commerce is actually up. So if you actually looked at e-commerce's market share today, it's enormous, right, as a percent of total U.S. retail. Now, when things normalize, I imagine there'll be kind of an ebb and flow. But I think we almost accelerated five years worth of consumer preference and consumer behavior change because totally. of um, well, I look look at look at if you think about rents as a great proxy for this. So you know we are on Sand Hill Road. We've had the same office for forty years, and um, the thought five years ago that we could run a franchise that manages seven billion dollars without setting foot in an office for a month right. was unthinkable, right? right? And yet here we are. We've been able in the last four weeks, as you know, do um, our fortieth annual meeting virtually. We've had our LP advisory call with LPs from all around the world. We're you know, in the midst of fundraising our 17th fund. And all of this has been, there's obviously trade-offs, but we've been able to run the firm, and I'd say pretty well and efficiently, in some ways better, virtually. When we go back and our landlords come to us in January of 2021 and say, hey, we're gonna up the rent, we're gonna say, we don't need the square footage anymore. We can, we're looking for a hybrid model where we do think it's important to have conference rooms and meeting places and workspaces 
but why can't that be at a shopping mall? Why can't that be in a suburban strip mall? Why does that need to be in an office park? And I actually think a lot of your corporate VCs will probably see this change happening. And I actually think the pie will get bigger because a lot of us can do some of our roles sitting in our home offices or apartments, but for certain things like meeting, like I cannot make a new investment right now without meeting an entrepreneur in person. It's just a principle I have where if I don't meet someone in person or have a chance to, um, do you still have that principle? Do you still adhere to that? I'm still adhering to that right now, but if someone tells me that this is work from home for the next year, I'm going to have to change that. Right? right. So I actually think, um, that'll be a really interesting trend in venture to see. I'm, it's a topic that all the top firms are talking about. Some partners are comfortable, some are not. I think my own prediction is we're all going to have to be amenable to this. Uh, for, I do think we've already moved to a world though in which we're comfortable making smaller investments. Most of our companies we've met 18 to 24 months before we ever invest. So a lot of them we just know already. Um, but I did pass on two investments last week because we came down to I like it, but I just never met the CEO, never visited the offices, and we'll see that change. I think the really exciting thing though is um, the traditional brokerage model of commercial real estate will be tra will completely transform. But I look at the unutilized real estate sitting there in suburban America or in urban America. And I say, yeah, some of the retail footprints will change, but I would love to be able to go to a Westfield mall and be able to dynamically use it to go to coffee, lunch, and have a board meeting. And I think that's a much better infrastructure setup than a lot of desolate office parks. So I think it's those, those- It's interesting to hear you say that so much in, in, in some respects as, as a venture capital fund, because the kind of, congregation of like-minded firms in a similar industry uh, is probably there's nowhere where that's more acute than sand hill road right? right sand hill road is this agglomeration of just all of the kind of venture capital powerhouses um and it's yeah. been that way for a long period of time and i guess there's some synergies by virtue of being close in the sense that an entrepreneur can kind of go from one venture fund to another venture fund in literally the same office park but in a world where that changes, and I know that rents are not cheap on Sand Hill Road, in a world where that changes, like, do you really think that's possible that you could effectively locate anywhere or have multiple small offices and most of your both internal team interactions and external team interactions are done virtually? The single highest expense for both startups and funds, uh, the two biggest are labor and real estate, right? It's people's salaries and basically rent. And what we have all learned from this process, there was, there was two trends that are already happening before COVID and then a third that's accelerated post-COVID. The first is, as you know from the fifth wall portfolio, this business is not hyper-local. So when IVP got started in the 80s, you know, all the companies were basically congregated in a 15 mile radius in the Bay Area, which is why it helped to have all the firms congregated in the same area. Today, we, but only half of our investments across the portfolio, we have 75 active companies are literally in the San Francisco Bay Area. The other half are in Los Angeles, uh, New York, Texas, Europe, you know, Israel. And so I think most venture firms have become more globally oriented, in which case the local office is already a relic of the past because so much of our time is at board meetings, getting on planes, meeting folks. Um, the second trend that I think has accelerated is um, there's, I always like to, the term entrepreneurial ecosystems. You sit, you're sitting, uh, you sit in one normally in Los Angeles. And what we realized was you really need to build market presences outside of the Bay Area to be able to build a brand. And you guys have done an amazing job of that at Fifth Wall in LA. But we, you know, we've started spending more time in New York and LA hosting dinners for entrepreneurs, adding value added services for those local markets. And you also realize that you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are so busy, they don't want to take a plane up and, you know, see a firm. And we have a company presenting on Monday to us virtually over Zoom, Austin company. And obviously now with COVID in place, you know, we can't have anyone travel on either side. But I'm pretty sure what's going to happen, Brendan, is from this point onwards, we're not going to go back to the old world where everybody's getting on planes to, have, you know, to show up in Sand Hill Road, you know, at 9 a.m. on a Monday. Things are happening virtually like, like this where you just send me a zoom link when here we are up and connected and we're like, you know, in multiple time zones, in multiple States. And that is just such a dramatic shift in mentality. Um, we're actually more productive in many ways working from home and our LPs would be, I think, delighted if we spent a little less money on office rent and we were, and we were more productive. So, um, the other I, I also, interesting thing so much, just to, just to note, you mentioned that for startups, um, 
you know, the, the two highest costs are labor and real estate. Right. And to a great extent, those are really interconnected costs, right? Mm-hmm. Because the reason it's so expensive to hire engineers in San Francisco is actually that rent is really high in San Francisco. And that's where the bulk of income goes for most employees. And so if this need to be close, this need to aggregate changes, you, you can envision just a far more distributed uh, startup ecosystem and a far more distributed labor ecosystem that, that supports them. And, and ultimately, like you think about how much of the venture capital dollars that pour into early stage companies um, over the last three years went to paying San Francisco landlords, right? Ultimately, it found its way to their pockets very quickly. And if that changes, I think the profile of certain cities, cities like New York and San Francisco, and to some extent, Los Angeles, are gonna change dramatically. So so I'll I'll give you two thoughts. Even before COVID, we had a dinner called The Future of Work last February, and our entrepreneurs were complaining that it had gotten prohibitively expensive in San Francisco to hire engineers. These were people who, you know, were a couple years out of school, worked at Google or Facebook, and were commanding salaries and bonuses of 300K, and um, office space on top of that was so expensive on a per employee basis that many were already moving to a distributed workforce, a part remote, part in person. They were looking to Eastern Europe and parts of Asia to uh, attract developer talent and not just back office, but real like core product of innovation and engineering. So this is a conversation that happened before COVID. Like the real estate industry, I think COVID is just gonna accelerate that transition. I, you know, one controversial point of view take it for what it's worth that I've had is, you know, your grandparents and my grandparents were really products about a hundred years ago of the industrial revolution, where many of them were originally, you know, part of agrarian societies, grew up probably in rural parts of America, rural parts of Europe, mine grew up in rural parts of India. And then our parents' generation was the suburban generation. In a lot of ways, the image of, an, of American middle-class life was the station wagon, you know, the four bedroom home, you know, sitting in, you know, 30, 40 miles from a big city. You grew up in Connecticut. I grew up in San Jose, away from San Francisco. And then all of us, our generation migrated to the New Yorks, the Los Angeles, and San Francisco's. I'm seeing in our own firm, the next generation say, hey, we're actually holed up in our parents' places in Scottsdale, Arizona, you know, or Nashville, Tennessee, and we're quarantining with them. And this is really nice. This is peaceful. We're more productive. We like this. This is nice. We may not want to go back to buying an expensive condo at $2,000 a square foot in Manhattan or in Selma. So I think our next generation is going to move back to the suburbs. And I think that'll be a trend that'll continue. Also from a safety standpoint, I do think if things get really bad here in 2021 post-election, we could see more crime. We're seeing it in San Francisco already. We could see potential rioting we could see really a, a accentuation of the rich poor gap, which was already bad, Brendan. And then I think, you know, frankly, my kids' generation, I think ag tech is going to boom, construction tech is going to boom. You know, you guys are investors in some of these companies, but you know, the ability to go to a rural part of Iowa and actually pretty soon, five, 10 years from now, build a very nice home for about a fifth of the construction cost, what it would cost in New York or San Francisco in the suburb, is going to be high. And food delivery plus food production is going to increase exponentially in these rural parts of America where there's still land available. So I could see a world in which our kids say, we don't want to live in, you know, the Upper East Side or Soho or Soma. We want to live actually in quiet parts and have different lifestyles than what you guys did. So that is a massive migration that could occur. And like, like venture, I think migrations are also cyclical. Um, I think immigration is going to be a big part of this where a lot of immigrants are going to look at this and say, you know what, we want to stay home and we want to build businesses in India and China and Asia. And our immigration policy is pretty screwed up, as you know, in this country um, in terms of skilled immigration. So I'm, uh, I think these are trends that actually are in your favor, which is why I think the disruption of traditional industries that will happen across the United States, forget San Francisco and New York, is going to accentuate. Yeah. And I mean, like just thinking about what that means then for residential real estate brokerage is kind of fascinating, right? The, the to, to some extent, it's, it's almost taken as a given that when people graduate college, they want to work in a big city, but to the extent they're actually re- reconsidering that, it, it, and, it, and it really fundamentally changes what work and work live work actually means. It's just interesting to think about then, do you think that leads to greater concentration of kind of these large 
national real estate brokerages that can truly cover the country or do you see more localization around brokerage? I mean, it's been interesting. If you look at the headlines from Redfin, Zilla, Word and Compass, I mean, this is a bleak period for residential brokerage of real estate. I mean, there are no open houses. There are, there's transaction volume. I, don't, I haven't seen the stats, but I'm sure it's dropping like crazy given COVID going on. Um, now, we all know that's a pause. We know that real estate will come back in 2021 when people are back uh, post-quarantining. I actually think that my, our own thesis is that it's very likely that we saw consolidation in real estate towards certain big cities. We see it with the data at Compass, where a big percentage of their transaction volume was basically the five big U.S. metros, and then they expanded to those bigger towns in the United States, the Cincinnati's and Nashville's and other cities and towns. Um, I actually see that as you're reversing potentially in the next 10 years, where I think what we'll find is that a lot of people will want to maybe do a period of hybrid isolation, where uh, they're going to want to be able to um, go find... Oh, look, we have a little cameo here. <laughs> He's not coming to the screen yet. Oh, there he is. How's it going? Say hi. Say hi. <laughs> he disappeared. All right. Um, so I'll come in a second. I'll come in a second. Oh, we have another cameo. Sorry, Brendan. I can bring my dog over if you'd like. Yeah, let's see what you We love dogs. <laughs> I don't know where she is. She's probably up to mischief somewhere. Right. Yeah. Um, just another interesting point that this, in some ways, highlights is like for for a lot of the Zoom meetings that that I've done, just seeing people in their home environment, um, in a in a weird way, builds higher levels of intimacy in I terms agree. of work relationship. In a way that there's obviously a, a level of formality at work that you, you kind of have to maintain. And it's, been, it's right. been interesting to see just within my own company and frankly amongst our CEOs, just what their home life is like um, because of things just like that. Like I've worked with some people in our firm for over a decade. I never saw even, you know, maybe a Christmas card here and there, but I never really saw their kids and their pets. We just did a virtual happy hour where everybody basically um, was able to bring their kids or pets. And then we just did a newsletter where everyone um, showed pictures of their cats and dogs and names. And right. it was just an example of, I think we're bringing humanity back to, you know, a pretty hard nosed private sector that had been running at, at breakneck speeds for the last decade. Um, and I think, I actually think relationships within companies are going to get better. The data is showing that, you know, people very much view their um, employers now like they view their colleges, like a affiliation that they want to continue well after they're done working there. I think a uh, contrarian point of view is the average tenure of a startup is 18 months right now. Uh, people switch jobs on average, meant like over half, less than 18 months. I think that'll actually go up. I think people will feel more connected after all this. Um, and the most important thing is, I think in the, in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if we think about what we want, we need self-actualization through our work, but we also need it through our families and our friends. Isolation, you and I have talked about this, teaches you um, the importance of building relationships. I think on the commercial term, building relationships with entrepreneurs, I think people are really valuing that fifth wall in IDP or reaching out to new companies, getting to know them, helping them out, even in a time where many other firms are just retreating. Um, but also you build real friendships, like you build real relationships so that, I mean, I can't wait to be able to like see you in person and be able to hang out because yeah. we took that for granted for the last 10 years. And now it's like, wow, we can't even go to Starbucks together. Yeah, I know. Um, so I'm curious just maybe as a way of kind of, um, ending this is given all of your experience, obviously having been through so many cycles, you know, there's so many, um, real estate corporates out there and just corporates across every sector of the economy that within the last three years started to do venture capital for the first time. Um, and in many ways, there's kind of one of two paths they can go down right? A retreat path, which is, oh my gosh, the world just changed. This is the first thing that should get cut. And then there's another path, which is really leaning into this opportunity. You talked a lot about how timing dictates the returns, the financial returns um, for, venture, for venture funds, with basically being started at the beginning of kind of a, a, a macro crisis, like, like what we're in now. 
What, what advice would you give the CEO of a real estate company right now in terms of what they should be doing around technology innovation and venture capital specifically? Well, you, know, the, you hit on a lot of important themes, which is we all know the importance of real estate. Like in the, in, you know, back to what we as human beings need, shelter, I mean, shelter in place is illustrating to us the importance of, of homes and, and places where we can work or, or have teams. So I do think that there's nobody who's going to be arguing that real estate is not going to be the, one of the most important forces in our, in our global economy in the next decade. I think the way we think about real estate, it's, a, it's similar to retail, which is another vertical you guys spend a lot of time in, where this just accelerates the changes. So first and foremost, I think taking your companies and making them into software digital uh, entities is important. And so bringing on engineering, design, UI, UX talent, QA talent, um, I think that's really important. And actually empowering those people to have more budget versus less, to have cutting edge uh, backend software, cutting edge production software. I think that is, it's, it's a DNA thing that's really important. Um, and by the way, you no longer have to open the Silicon Valley office to do that. You could probably get a lot of people that live in the Bay Area or New York who have those skills to work remotely or hybrid. Uh, where they travel to your corporate site maybe one week a month and they work remotely the rest. That's actually going to help a lot of commercial real estate entities. Um, I think the most important thing you guys know in venture that a lot of corporates sometimes miss is learn how to say no before you learn how to say yes, which is the key thing is a filter and a funnel where at a time like this, um, it's important to have, to be in market, meeting lots of companies, getting lots of data, building relationships, but just because you do that doesn't mean you should feel the urgency to pull the trigger and actually invest in all of them. You have to stay selective. You never want to be out of market, but you also never want to, um, this is going to be a long period as we, you and I talked about. So there's no need to sit there and try to do five deals a month right now. There's, it's important to take your time. You guys are doing that at fifth wall, which I think is smart. Um, and I think the key thing is having kitchen table cabinets like you guys uh, are for many of them at fifth wall where a lot of the, the great investment decisions we've made at IVP came down to just a few conversations we had where it wasn't obvious. Like the Twitter round we did, it was February 2009. Um, you know, President Obama had just been elected. TARP was in full session. The financial markets were hemorrhaging. Bear Stearns and Lehman had gone down. And in the midst of this comes Twitter where, if you remember, you know, they had basically um, found the uh, Bombay terrorist attacks. They had been part of the... Um, the landing uh, by Captain Sully, you know, in, in New Jersey. And they had all these historic news events had been broken on Twitter first before commercial media um, and news media. And they had 10 million unique users. They'd spent no money in marketing. They had a bunch of outages. And we just met the team. And we're like, this is going to be amazing. But it was controversial because they were raising at $200 million with no revenue. And now everyone tells us that was so obvious. And that we do that deal in a second. But at the time, it was so contrarian. And we had a very spirited debate. And what I would get back to for your corporate um, partners and investors is the great thing about venture investing is asymmetric risk return. So the worst thing that happens is you lose your principal and you lose it in a relatively short period of time. But the best thing that happens is you find a company that just beats all odds, beats internal expectations like Twitter did for us. We ended up um, returning uh, the entire $600 million fund on that one investment, I believe we returned $800 million on a $45 million investment. And um, that was just to us an illustrative way of seeing the upside cases that are there. And all the time, we, I mean, we were also in Living Social in that fund and other companies that didn't do well. And yes, we wish we hadn't done some of those. But at the end of the day, we lost, you know, 30, 40 million, we lost our principal. But I mean, we still ended up with a 3.5x fund. That's the important true north to remember is there's just so much upside that's still there. These businesses are, are going to grow fast. They're going to be agile. They're going to be capital efficient. You have things like AWS that enable you to spend less on infrastructure. And actually, I think COVID will help companies be even more lean and grow even faster. So I think it's actually, it's probably the best time. We had slowed down our pace in 2019 and, and 2018. It's a really good time, I think, to um, have a fund and have partners like Fifth Wall to be able to take advantage of these trend lines. Yeah. Well, so much. Thank you so much for doing this, despite our uh, our technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> but uh, 
anyway, I really appreciate this and I hope you and your family and all your colleagues uh, remain safe in this really uncertain time. So thanks for joining. Yeah, great. And Brent, if any of your CEOs or, or partners or investors want to reach me, I'm at S-D-A-S-H and I-D-P. I'm also active on Twitter. So just reach out anytime. You know where to find me. I'm at home on Zoom. So. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Owen. Thanks. Bye.